Hey, so I'm going to talk about hardware. How many people here are working on a piece of hardware? That's pretty good. How many people have manufactured more than 100 units or something? Oh, wow. All right. How about 1,000 units or something? Wow. How about 10,000? Wow. OK, I see two, three. How about 100,000? No one. OK, cool. Awesome. So um, it's, it's interesting. Hard, uh, hardware has become really hot, right? which I don't really fully understand. Um, I like it regardless of its inness or outness. Um, but it's funny, because a couple years ago, um, this was a very strange thing. Hardware uh, was, was often sort of the, the bastard child of the investment scene. And if you were to go raise money, often the second that you would mention that you were working on a, a hardware product, an investor would swiftly show you the door. And that's completely changing. So why, why is that? Well, there are a bunch of reasons. Um, one is the thing that most people have in your pockets, a smartphone. And this allows so much of the intelligence of a piece of hardware to be offloaded to a device that you've already purchased. So has anybody heard of a company called Chumbi? No, not too many people. All right, well, there's a reason for that. Um, but they came right before the iPhone launch, and they had to do an, a ton of development work to get the internet stack to be working on their device. It's incredibly difficult. Now you can just use a Bluetooth connection and connect to your phone, and you don't have to do any of that work, which is great. Um, contract manufacturing has become really big. When, when you were Apple 20 or 30 years ago, you had to go out and build a production assembly line, which costs millions and millions of dollars. And you don't have to do that anymore. You can use companies like Foxconn or Jetta, uh, typically in Shenzhen and coastal China, where you can actually pay them to, to do the capital intensive work of manufacturing. Uh, 3D printing has become really hot, which is, which is sort of interesting. 3D printing has been around for about 35 years, hasn't changed too much, except it's gotten a whole bunch cheaper. But for some reason, people are starting to talk about it all the time, which is great. It's a wonderful tool for people, people like me that do product design and development. Uh, I'm not so sure about it for the general audience of the public, but we'll see. Um, and crowdfunding has become really big. This is, a, a, again, a fairly new thing to provide access to capital. And it's particularly helpful for hardware companies where they're selling a physical product to consumers. Now, while it's really helpful, it's still just one tiny piece of building a business. It's super useful for building a product. But a product and a, and a business are two very different things. So there are a ton of other things that you still have to do when you're building a hardware business. The first and the most important, you've probably heard this 50 times today, is team. People are so important. And you still need an exceptional team. None of these things have changed since the beginning of this hardware revolution. Prototyping. This is actually a really early prototype of Google Glass. I've seen a couple of people walking around outside with, with Google Glass. This is one of the first prototypes that's been 3D printed in this big, nasty circuit board. This is still a really important part of the process in developing a piece of hardware, just like in software. You still need an awesome market. So you want to be working on something that's really significant. And sometimes this is a whole bunch of consumers. And sometimes it's one specific business that has a really desperate need. But you want to do something significant. Tooling. This is something that people get really worried about. This is these big, expensive pieces of steel and aluminum that help you actually manufacture your product at scale. And this is typically very capital intensive. When you're working with a software company, you go to Amazon Web Services or Heroku, and you can scale your product much faster. Uh, tooling uh, is very expensive. You know, typical tooling is fifty to $200,000, depending on uh, what kind of product you're building, how complicated it is, how many units you want to be able to get out of that tooling. And this is still something that you have to do every single time you build something at scale. Shipping. This is really uh, something that people don't think about in hardware. Um, this is a, c a container ship full of about 5,000 containers or cans that are holding a, uh, uh, parts that are moving from typically coastal China into Long Beach, California, where most of our products come from, uh, come, come into the United States. This takes about four weeks. So this is a very time intensive process. Some companies can fly their product from China here. And it's, uh, it's very, very, very expensive, but makes sense for certain kinds of products. This is something that people don't think about often. It's still incredibly fundamental. You have to move move things from the factory into a truck, from a truck onto a boat, from a boat onto another truck in, in the United States, from a truck there to a distribution center, and then from a distribution center into retail. There's so many steps, and you're paying for all of that time. 
inventory, of course. So things have to get stored, right? So you're not, you're not selling something as, you're not giving someone something as soon as it's purchased. It's often stored in, in, in a big facility with hundreds of thousands of units of your product sitting on shelves waiting to be, to be moved into retail. This is something, again, you're paying per day or per month for this, for this facility. Retail, people get so frustrated with retail. I don't know how long Best Buy is gonna be around, but if they continue to be here, it's another thing you that you have to worry about. Again, just like major hardware in the past. And capital, this is uh, fundamental to any company. Most hardware companies require an additional capital compared to a typical software business. And that's okay, you just have to understand what you need. So, oh man, that's loud. <laughs> Um, so this stuff is really difficult, right? Uh, a lot of people haven't been through this process. It's fairly easy to do some of these things with software, but it's very difficult to scale with hardware. You have to know what you're doing. They call it hardware for a reason, right? So uh, we built a company called Bolt, which is built from the ground up to help hardware startups get through all of these things, right? We sort of think of it as a combination of three things. One is a product design and development firm. If you guys have heard of IDEO or Frog Design, it helps with engineering and design services for companies all across the world. We're a little tiny version of that, too. Um, one is a venture capital firm, so we actually make capital investments in companies, typically between, uh, between uh, 50000 and $200,000 of capital. And then we provide a ton of manufacturing support. So this is about this whole infrastructure of getting to retail or getting to market if you're not a consumer product. So the, these sort of three things combine to create this weird entity that doesn't have a, a paradigm uh, that we call Bolt. And our goal here is to ship products. So we worked a little di differently than a lot of VC firms or other incubators or accelerators. Our primary metric is how many products have you shipped and are the people happy that get those products, right? You don't want to ship crappy stuff. We provide five big things to every company that gets into Bolt. And these things are really important to us, and they should be important to any hardware startup. The first, again, people. So we have a team of people that have been there and done that, has shipped tens of millions of units and invested billions of dollars of venture capital. So we've done this before. These are some things that we've worked on. I think Eric's here from Pebble. So Scott, one of my partners uh, at Bolt, is the guy that manufactured all of the Pebble watches that some of you may have out there. Um, we did Roomba, which is this awesome vacuum cleaner that uh, you know, clean, cleans your house for you, which is fantastic for guys like me that don't like to vacuum. Um, uh, SolidWorks, if you, if you know the cat industry, we, um, one of my other partners was, a, was the early financier of SolidWorks. E-Ink, the, the display for the Kindle, if you guys know the, the Amazon Kindle product. So we've done a lot of these products and know this world very well. The second thing is this awesome shop. Now, I love to build stuff, and so this is definitely the coolest part for me. Um, but we have about a million dollars of prototyping equipment, 3D printers and high-end CNC machines and laser cutters and stamping and all kinds of awesome things that young companies really need access to to build prototypes. This is not uh, fun tools that you find in your, in your sort of grandfather's basement. These are real high-end pieces of equipment that the companies use completely for free if they're accepted into our program and into our portfolio. Uh, this is what our space kind of looks like. I figured this would be sort of interesting. So this is a boring office shot. Um, this is uh, the shop. Uh, some 3D printers and laser cutters. Uh, big CNC machine. The third thing is capital. And this is really important. Again, so we provide cash to every company that they can spend how they see fit, just like any other investment. We're typically the first or second investor, so really early stage companies. And then we have a bunch of value added capital. So these are discounts with companies like ProtoMold. If you've ever heard of ProtoMold, they do rapid tooling for companies for injection molding. This is for manufacturing. And we provide companies with free tooling, so they don't have to worry about spending thousands and thousands of dollars on big pieces of steel. Uh, we have relationships with other companies. If we can't do high-end prototyping for something, we can't do everything in the world. So we have a company that can do everything in the world, and we have a discount with them, and a, a whole bunch of other services like that. And then we provide lines of credit for every company. So people get $100,000 from Arrow Electronics, which is one of the big uh, electronic distributors around the world, uh, and helps people solve the cash flow problem, which is a big difficulty in hardware startups, again. 
The fourth thing is manufacturing. So the, these things get really technical. I don't know how technical this audience is. You guys can ask me more about this if you're curious. But the manufacturing process is really intense. And you have to really know what you're doing. Uh, a lot of people make mistakes here because they've never done it before. And so if they are you know, trying to find a factory in China, they don't know which questions to ask, what kind of factory to talk to. Uh, usually, you want to look at a whole bunch of factories and pick the one that really suits your needs the best. You want to understand how much money they have, and can you meet the bosses of the factory and have weight with them, and you know, be able to talk about volume if you grow, and how to move, and all these complicated things that I'm happy to get into more if you guys have questions. And the fifth thing, and, and probably the most important thing from a business perspective, is commercialization. So actually getting these products to market. And there are a whole bunch of things that are along the way from you know, the, the end of our program all the way up through you know, a product on a store shelf. So uh, raising follow-on capital. So the, the couple hundred thousand dollars we provide is usually not enough to actually get to uh, a full-scale full production and, and retail distribution. So we actually help people in Boston raise additional venture capital, typically a Series A of a couple million dollars. We help with crowdfunding if companies believe that that's right for them. This is actually not appropriate for most hardware companies if you want to build a company. So you have to uh, know what makes Kickstarter work and not work and what kind of product you're trying to build. So we have a ton of advice from people that have done this before. Uh, licensing, our friend McLovin from uh, a great movie here. Um, so if we, if we uh, decide that a product makes a lot of sense to license through another manufacturing partner, whether it's a medical device or some other product that has a uh, sort of a long time scale to get to market, sometimes having a big partner actually help you go through that process is more effective than raising money and doing it on your own. So we actually facilitate that relationship. And then getting into retail. So we have a huge network of buyers that are the people that actually purchase components from you or product from you and place it on a shelf. And so we say, oh, this is a product that would be really good for Brookstone. Here's John Smith, the guy that runs you know, the, the, the buyer for your, your kind of consumer product at Brookstone or what have you. Uh, we are incredibly lucky to work with some incredible, amazing people. Um, so uh, the, uh, some of these may be unfamiliar to European companies, but um, Mick Mounts, who's one of my favorite people in the world, runs a company called Kiva Systems, which is this really cool company that just got bought by Amazon. They do sort of uh, automated distribution inside of big pa uh, picking facilities for Amazon. Um, you guys know Guitar Hero? You guys play the or rock band? Is that big here? Yeah. So, so uh, Iran is the co-founder of, of Harmonix Music Systems, which came out with that game, which is an amazing story, by the way. Uh, and a whole bunch of other folks. Brad Feld is a really well-known venture capital investor in Boulder, Colorado. Then we have some awesome big companies. So we, again, we, we work like a venture fund. So we have a, a whole bunch of people that are putting money that we reinvest in other companies. And so we have some big strategic partners that are putting you know, multi-million dollar checks into our fund. So uh, ideally, we work with companies that are about nine months before they're ready to ship or manufacture a product. So that's sort of like the time scale that we think. We don't care how early or late or how long you've been together or how much money you've raised. It's all about value add. And so it's really important to us to work with companies that believe in shipping a product, right? That's, that's what we care about. Um, there are also a whole bunch of other companies that do things that are sort of related to hardware. Again, hardware is becoming really big, and so there are a whole bunch of facilities that you can now start to ask questions of. It, you know, I think when it comes to software, it's pretty, it's pretty easy to get help. There's Stack Overflow and, again, Heroku and you know, all these forums where people can sort of guide you through learning Ruby on Rails or what have you. Um, with hardware, there's no place to go where, hey, I want to learn how to build an injection mold tool. What do I do? What, what do I look for? And so there's um, a growing sort of, sort of surge of people that are out there to help you do some of these things. Um, there, are, there are programs like Y Combinator and Techstars, which are accelerator programs, which are starting to see more and more hardware companies, which is great. They don't have the world's most expertise, but they're there to, to, to provide support if, if need be. Um, and then there are a whole bunch of these hardware incubator programs that are also sort of geared towards, har uh, towards hardware companies specifically. Uh, there's been you know, a bunch of them cropping up in the last couple of months. So th these are great resources for hardware companies. Um, and then uh, this is something that I, find, I think is important for every company, not specifically hardware. But uh, something that we get asked about all the time is, is what do investors look for when you're, when you're trying to go out and raise money? Like, wh what should I optimize my presentation or my discussion or my company for? The first thing, again, uh, you hopefully take a guess here, is, is that team, right? So, so any investor that you talk to, at least any good investor that I talk to, is usually talking about people. They want to know that the people are going to be there to execute on what they're talking about doing. And that's really, really important. 
The second is you want to be working on something significant, right? So we see a ton of amazingly cool products, uh, especially on Kickstarter and Indiegogo and other crowdfunding platforms, but they don't necessarily transition well into a business because the market is not interesting enough. If you look at a typical venture investor, they're looking for a company that will be a minimum multi-hundred million dollar company. Uh, now, a lot of times they don't get there, but they're shooting for that. And so you want to understand that the market is going to be significant enough to support a company like that. This is, this is a big one. Uh, traction is really, is really helpful. So if you have, um, whether it's you've shipped units or you've done a crowdfunding campaign that's been successful, um, or you have early customers that have played with prototypes and had really good things to say, all of these things signify that what you're working on is important. And this is something that any investor and really any customer will, will want to see. They want to know that you're going to be around for years to support what, what you're providing with them. And the fourth thing brought to you by our friend Elon, um, who I think has the most amazing vision of any entrepreneur that um, at, at least is alive today, is a vision of something uh, that's going to change the world. And this is incredibly important to, um, to investors that really care about making an impact. Not every investor does, but we really like the ones that do because it's way more fun to work with them that way. Um, so I'm here to help. Uh, again, I'm, I'm happy to provide uh, any answers to any questions that you may have. I think there's this slide, Slideio. I don't know where, I don't know anything here, but there's this website where you can ask questions. So if you guys have any questions about hardware, manufacturing, uh, product development, engineering, uh, raising money, uh, I am here to try to answer them as best I can. Well, there are some questions are some. posted here already. Oh, cool. The top Great. ones are the voted ones. Awesome. Should, well, should we have a mic too. Should so I, I read the question, how do you deal with quality assurance and returns when you're delivering to your first 500 early adopters? Sure. So this is, this is really hard. Any single company is going to have to deal with returns of product. This is something that you don't necessarily have happen with software, right? Because when someone says, ah, I really don't like your product, I just want my money back, you just issue a return and you're done. When it comes to hardware, they often have to send something back to you. You have to inspect it and see what's wrong. And sometimes you want to send it back. Sometimes you want to give them a refund and sometimes you don't. Um, so deal dealing with quality is probably the most important thing that hardware companies overlook in the manufacturing process. They're paying attention to things like bill of materials and costs and time. And these things are important, but quality is what will last for many, many years. And so you want to make sure that your product is going to be you know, around and your customers are going to be really happy. Um, so d dealing with it is not a simple uh, f issue. It, it's sort of... It's uh, designed really, there are really two parts of this. One is in the manufacturing process and making sure that the products that you're building are actually good. And the second is in the customer support process when after they've received their product, making sure that they're happy and are able to make returns if possible. Um, there's no sort of silver bullet for making this work, but usually the same characteristics apply as with a, as with a software company. You want to be really open and communicative and responsive when people ask uh, for, for questions about their product. It's not easy to deal with and it's very expensive. Typically, young hardware startups have, a, have between a 10 and 15% return rate um, for early, early products coming off the production line, which is really, really high. Uh, we try to keep that low. Big companies are usually 2 or 3%. Um, but it, because you're new at this, it's, 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 it's very difficult to do well. Good. Uh, next question. Um, do you provide visas for international companies to join your accelerator? We don't provide visas. Uh, we help with that process. This is unfortunately a really big problem um, for probably a lot of you guys out here. Um, we had, uh, so for our last, our last uh, batch of pitches, we had about 850 companies um, that submitted a, a, a deck to us, and we chose seven, so it's pretty selective. Um, none of those happened to be international, though we did probably get about 200 companies that did apply um, from, from the international space. So um, again, we actually haven't worked through that yet, but we're happy to help in any way that we can, providing letters and other things that, that folks need in the US. Talking about applications, there was a question before about when will be the applications for Bold 2014? Yeah, so um, we're going to post information on that very, very soon. Uh, the next uh, group of companies, so we're allowing about three companies in every couple of months, every three months or so. Um, so the, the next uh, sort of open, open application uh, for, for pitching the partners at Bolt uh, will be in early 2014. And then companies will show up about two months later. So sort of like uh, the, the end of Q1 of 2014. All right. I think you answered that you already would invest <laughs> in non-US companies. Um, the second one is do all of the added costs and times with a hardware startup like tolling, shipping, et that cetera, is, have an impact on the success rates of startups? That is a Can great question. Can they work around this? Um, 
So uh, absolutely, right? So if it costs more money, it means that it takes more time because you have to have that money to be, to be able to use and spend. Um, this means that companies that wind up uh, you know, failing uh, often is because they run out of capital because of something that they did wrong. Um, sometimes this is they didn't predict how much money they needed to manufacture a product. Sometimes it's because the quality is so low they had to redo something or the tooling was bad so they had to scrap it and start over. Uh, so these, the, the margin for error is much slimmer when it comes to hardware. Um, I, I would say that, uh, there, again, there's no uh, easy way around this. The most effective thing that we found is to work with people that know what they're doing. So there are fir there's a firm that we work with um, very closely called Dragon Innovation, uh, which helps young startups actually go to China, find a factory, deal with that whole you know, bill of materials and quality process, and help with logistics, so shipping and supply chain management. Um, so that's really, really useful. Uh, it, it's very hard to learn by yourself. It just takes a long time because there's so many new things that you have to look for. Uh, it's, especially when you're going to China, you're looking at a culture that's very, very different. I'm going there in a week, uh, actually in, uh, tomorrow. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to navigate for the first time when companies are doing this. So you want to you wanna work with people that know what they're doing and have an infrastructure and support network that they can help you with. Anything else? <sighs> Number one, well, it's changing very quickly. <laughs> um, how do you handle Chinese factories or producers? How do you handle them? Um, carefully. Uh, any, any person that you work with is a partner, right? So I think a lot of people treat manufacturers as, uh, as, as a supplier, and that's completely a mistake. This is like treating an investor as someone outside of your company, and they're really not. They're sitting on the same side of the table with you, they own equity, and they want to see your company succeed just like you do, at least hopefully just like you do. When you're working with a factory, that factory is controlling your your company in a way that sometimes people don't want to admit. They own, um, they, they have you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars of inventory tied up, whether it's in tooling or in, in parts or in plastic that hasn't shipped yet or in boxes that are waiting to, to leave the factory. Um, so you want to be very, very cautious of that relationship. It's incredibly important that they are on your side and they want to see you succeed. And just like an investor, they're in it for the long run. They don't make money if you make 5,000 units. They make money if you make 500,000 units or 5 million units. And so they want to work with companies that they see growing, just like everybody does. It's much more exciting to be working on the next big thing than something that's going to go away in a couple of months. So working with factories in a way that treats them respectfully and helps them grow just the way that you would want to be treated is a really important way to work with companies. The next question is number one issue of hardware startups. Number one issue. Um, that's very hard to say. Uh, if you mean of a company that's already running, uh, often um, manufacturing is a, is a big problem that companies have. Uh, people al also don't pay attention to distribution, uh, which is the actually getting product into the hands of customers. So we actually uh, love to work with B2B products where this is a different problem. But with uh, B2C products, consumer products, it's really important to pay attention to how to move your product to customers. So sometimes this is getting into retail. So this is talking to buyers at retail stores. Sometimes this is selling them yourself on a, on a website, uh, which is really hard to do for, for significant volume, but maybe a good way to start. Uh, sometimes crowdfunding is an effective way to get to market. Um, but paying attention to this distribution problem is really important. Often you need a dedicated salesperson to actually support you in, in this role. And having someone that has a ton of relationships selling hardware is, is, is again, I found to be really, really critical. Um, People have trouble with prototyping a lot. They build, you know, hey, here's this Arduino board I built for you. I'm ready to make 500,000 copies of it. And it's sort of like, oh, no, you have to start over and re re redesign it from scratch. Uh, many of these techniques are really good for prototyping, but they're not fantastic for large-scale manufacturing. And so thinking through how you're going to prototype and build something at scale is really important. And again, it, just working, working with people that have done it before is the best way to solve that problem. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. Is a lean hardware startup even possible? Sure. So this is actually pretty funny. Um, uh, the, the term lean actually comes from hardware. Uh, so uh, I don't know if you guys know Toyota. I'm hoping you do the big car company. Um, so they have done some amazing, amazing things over the year with production. And so lean uh, is the sort of just Toyota production system, which is the thing that every you know, mechanical engineer should study in college, is uh, a way to make things uh, much more efficiently. And so this lean manufacturing actually came from that, I think, in the 80s or so. Um, and it's funny that the term lean has been sort of taken over by the 
the, by the software movement. Um, now, now, there are reasons for that. Is a, is, is a hardware company ever going to be cheaper to start than a software company? Probably not, um, especially because most hardware companies are actually really software companies. They happen to sell a piece of hardware, but they spend a ton of time and IP developing their software component. So this is this connected devices, Internet of Things, m There's all these little terms out there. But they basically talk about uh, the, you know, sort of my, my favorite term, which is software wrapped in plastic. Um, and so these are relatively simple pieces of hardware, but they're backed by a service or a piece of software. Uh, so it, it, it winds up being that the, the leanness of hardware is, is relative to typical hardware production rather than software companies. So, so again, the, the, sort of the proof is in the pudding here. You can be very, very efficient building a hardware company if you know what you're doing. And so this is things like you know, crowdfunding can be very, very helpful, working with people that have manufactured before, having good relationships with, with retail distribution and buyers can be helpful. Um, it is not necessarily lean in terms of capital, but it can be lean in terms of the, the, the sort of Eric Reese principles of the lean startup, you know, talking to customers and, and understanding how to iterate very rapidly. So absolutely. We have a question from the audience. Sure. Hey. Hey. Um, we've, we have a lot of experience in software, and yeah. we just started getting into hardware. And cool. We theoretically have something that we would like to turn into a real product. We prototyped it in Arduino mm -hmm. and all that stuff. We awesome. have an awful, you know, the case that we 3D printed, 3D printed. But sure. like, what is the number one research that you would take a look at to take this prototype into something that we might want to, you know, like manufacture and you know estimate the costs? Like, because we have absolutely no idea like how to take a pr hardware prototype into something that is manufacturable. So, so part of the problem is there's no, you know, sort of silver bullet for, the, for this problem. There's no, you know, after step two, you do step three for hardware. It's all different depending on what you're doing. So if you're working on a consumer product, then you probably want to figure out if people want the thing that you're building. Have you already done that? Have you, like, given prototypes to consumers and kind of seen what their reaction has been? We have one. We have one, we have one okay. that we really like. Sure. <laughs> And then we're thinking how to, you know, like multiply it into like 50 or, sure. and I know it's not a scale, right? But like how to turn this prototype into like 50 or, or 500 or a thousand, but not sure. like so a million. We, we kind of call that the uncanny valley of manufacturing. It, it's, it's really easy to make one and 10 of something. It's really easy to make a hundred thousand of something uh, easy relative to, you know, the, the things that people do to build companies. Um, it, this middle zone of you know, two or 3,000 units is really, really difficult. Uh, most manufacturing facilities that you'd contract out have a minimum order quantity of about 5,000 units. And so if you can't get into that 5,000, sometimes you can get 3,000 or so. But if you can't get up into that, into that era, then it's really complicated. And so you often have to make them yourself. Um, there are all kinds of specific techniques I can talk about, from urethane casting to companies like Protomold, which have very high per part costs uh, for injection molding, but very uh, low turnaround times, which is very helpful. Um, uh, again, I think that um, building prototypes is actually relatively easy compared to large scale manufacturing. So if you're trying to build 50 or something, I'm happy to talk to you more about exactly what you should do. Thanks. Great cool. talk. Any more questions? Back there, there's a guy with a hat on. Yeah. Can you pass the mic, <laughs> please? Hi. Hey there. Um, I just got a qu small question. Uh, we are okay. actually in a, uh, at the moment, uh, me and my family, uh, me and my family, uh, well, I talk about family when I talk about partners and companies. Sure. It's that, already my great. family. Um, okay, me and my family, <laughs> we are currently in the redesign uh, process uh, of our product. Uh, okay. And I get a question, how do you regularly deal with uh, the old models which are still in stock? Oh yes. You know, uh, do you? I mean, how do you handle that normally? With uh, I mean, the opposite, uh, the obvious ways to handle it with discounts. But sure. So, so uh, you um, just to make sure I understand, you you've um, you've shipped a product. It's sitting in retail stores now, uh, and it's gone through what's called EOL end of life. So the product has been discontinued, but you still have units that are out there in the wild. Right? That's right. And you're trying to figure out what to do with those units. Well, the thing is, uh, the new models they will be shipped soon. Huh? 
Okay. So, it, um, so we still wait for them, but uh, we still got many uh, products in in stock. Is this uh, in in Europe or is this is this? It's in Europe. It's in, in Europe. Europe. Yeah. Okay. Is it in a major retailer or is it in sort of small niche uh, retailers? Very small one. Small. Okay. We're a startup. Um, okay. No. Great. Uh, so so it's just different because sometimes um, you know companies like Best Buy and Apple Store and Target will actually ship those products back to you. So they say, oh man, we didn't sell them. You're coming out with a new product in 90 days. We don't want these anymore because no one's going to buy them. And so that's actually taking up you know a lot of their money to have on, on the shelf. Oh. Um, so when, when you have products, there are typically two things you can do. One is exactly what you said. You can offer them uh, at a discount. Um, there are also ways that you can move units through other channels that have uh, less of a concern about being really new and, and, and innovative in terms of the products they carry. So you can sometimes buy things on uh, what they call the gray market, uh, which are sort of things that are not necessarily supposed to be sold uh, for a specific location or region or time or cost. And you can move them into that area of distribution. Um, again, it depends on what your product is exactly where it should go, but you can find, you know, even it's things like. So, sorry, what? It's a mini table tennis table. <laughs> <laughs> actually, actually, we sell mini table tennis tables. Mini um, table tennis tables. Uh, a regular. It's, it's already a mini, table right? Tennis, dish tennis. Sorry. Um, oh. Table tennis. Ping yeah. pong. Okay. Huh? Got it. Thanks. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So. Um, so I don't know, you probably want to find um, some sort of sports retailer that, that sells those kinds of things. If you already are working with them, I'm not really sure. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> cool. I'm, I'm happy to talk to you more backstage. Thanks a lot. Cool. A anything else? Where is it? Hardware. Okay. Cool. All right. Oh, yeah, there's one right there. Uh, quick question, quick answer, please. We have to sure. come to an end. Hey, hello. Hey. Uh, how much equity do you take? How much equity do we yes. take? It's highly dependent on the stage of the company, right? So just like any venture capital firm, they depend on, on you know, how much money the company has raised before, how much money we're investing, the stage of the company, um, and how many products they've shipped, et cetera. Um, we often uh, deal with common stock. So because we're a very early investor, we want to actually be on the same side of the table as, at, as, as the, you know, the, the, the founder shares, which is really important to the way we operate. Um, because companies often, uh, I'd say about 50% of the companies that we work with were the first money in to a company. And so we want to make sure that we support those entrepreneurs as much as we can. And by having you know, all, all kinds of complicated preferred uh, stock treatment, we don't uh, believe that that's effective for, for young, really young, young hardware companies. We want to be helpful. Okay. Often, uh, often for, for those kinds of companies, we take around 10% common. Good. Then there were a few more hands up okay. and a few more questions on Slido, but it's, we're it's out of see. time. Okay. Are you going to be at the bar? I will. All right, so Ben like is bars. going to be at the Tribe Fire Bar, which is just behind the academy for 20, 30 minutes, so you can ask him of questions course. and cool. hopefully answer. Him. All right? Awesome. Well, thank you then so much. Thank you very much. Give it up for Ben Einstein.